we can go ahead and get going to give a few housekeeping tips. I know people are still coming in. Um, so hi, everybody. My name is uh, Tina McCorkendale. I am the president and CEO of the Institute for Public Relations. And I presented a webinar about a report that we released in January, uh, I did that in January, looking at behavioral science techniques. This is a different webinar in case you joined that one and were wondering. Uh, so it's really great to have you all here. So before we begin, just to give you a few housekeeping notes, we will have time for questions at the end. You can also ask questions throughout and I'll try to keep track of the chat. If not, uh, Nikki or somebody on the team will be happy to send them to me. There's also a Q&A box, feel free to ask them there. And uh, we do have a chat box, but please just chat and leave resources and that sort of thing. We will post some of the resources that we talk about in this webinar, but if you have any specific questions, please do that in the Q&A box. All right, so let's go ahead and get to it. Let me move myself so I don't have to look at myself. All right, so let's talk about how organizations can improve vaccine uptake. I've been updating this even up till this morning because guidelines change quite a bit over time and what organizations are doing. And some organizations, it seems, they like to look around and see what others in their industry are doing. So this is as up to date as it is for today. And who knows what we will see uh, tomorrow. Okay, so let's show us where this is where we are right now. This is as of August 3rd, today is August the 5th, and it looks at where we are in terms of vaccinations. A lot of this will be primarily from a US perspective, but it's important to know that some of the techniques and, and strategies that we talk within will be for applied to a wide range of audiences. So one of the things when we're talking about vaccination numbers is knowing specifically what we're reporting. As you can see this chart here uh, from the CDC, there's all sorts of metrics here, whether they tell you what percentage of the total population is, population over the age of 12, which is the in the US specifically, that is the youngest you can be to get vaccinated, and then what you see over 18 years of age. So the numbers that we see reported quite a bit with at least one dose are the 70% over 18. But as you can see, when you look at the 12 years and older, you have 68%. And then the total population has children who are under the age of 12 who are not yet eligible for vaccinations. So probably one of the good numbers to look at is the 12 years of age and older uh, because they've been um, eligible for a few months and that is sort of where our trajectory is. So just also to see where we are in terms of administration of vaccinations. And this is also CDC as of August 2nd. So this is fresh data. You can see it takes like a bell-shaped curve, but it's gonna to continue to go. Uh, where we saw a spike in the vaccinations um, at the time where they became available and continued to grow when it became available to larger audiences. And then you see pretty much a steady decline. Um, and it's been, it's been hovering about the same uh, since then. So with, this is another great uh, study. This is from the Kaiser Family Foundation. And I would say of a lot of research that is done, Kaiser Family Foundation is really one of the best sources. This is a survey of 1600 adults that was conducted through July 27th. Um, the number of share of adults who say they will get vaccinated as soon as they can has remained relatively unchanged since June at 3%. Those who are most skeptical of COVID vaccines believe they do more harm than contracting COVID itself. 53% of the unvaccinated survey by KFF said they believe that the vaccine is more dangerous than the disease. More than half of that group also thinks that the pandemic has been blown out of proportion by the media and don't believe that the Pfizer, Moderna, or J&J &J vaccine is as effective as reported by news and public health officials. <clears throat> and that is really important because that's, that's a trust in, in terms of institutions. And we'll talk about that in just a second. On the flip side, 88% of those who have received such shots believe that COVID, the disease itself, is the bigger health risk. So the vaccine skepticism follows socio-political and demographic guidelines. So I included some for women up here, where women, for instance, are more likely to say that they have gotten the shot, but political ideology is a really important factor as well in explaining who is and who isn't getting the vaccine. The gender gap that has emerged with vaccine uptake is still present. As you can see, that women are eight percentage points more likely to report being vaccinated than men who are at 63%. 
And a larger share of men say that they will definitely not get the vaccine at 18% versus 10%. This is largely attributed to differences in partisan identification between men and women because larger shares of men compared to women identify as Republicans or Republicanly leaning independents. I want to make a note here, which is really important, that when we talk about these demographic identifiers, whether it's gender, race, political ideology, it's not to criticize or to call out certain demographics or groups for their lack of vaccinations. Rather, it should be used as an understanding of the audience that needs to be targeted to increase vaccine uptake. So that is why when we point out you know, women versus men, it's not a competition. It really is where are the individuals who need, who need better intervention strategies to help increase vaccine uptake. And then it goes without saying that there are people who can't get vaccinated, people who are immunocompromised, children, and, and people for religious reasons who don't get vaccinated. So those are really important to recognize as well. But I just wanted to say that up front uh, so people don't send me angry chats, please. All right. Uh, and so IPR, we did this communicator's guide to COVID-19 vaccination. Uh, we can pop a link to that in the chat. Uh, and we published this in January and in December, January. And these models and guides and what we talk about are still really applicable today. So you can pull in and learn about behavioral science strategies, intervention strategies, also communication models and theories for how you can uh, considerations when devising a plan for communicating to employees, communicating within organizations, within certain employee research groups or so on. Um, and it's also important to recognize that not everyone works in corporate. So there's a lot of great nonprofits and state departments that are doing excellent communication work to get the message out. So the first thing to talk about is that vaccine hesitancy is not due to a lack of information. If you have employees or individuals in the community who are not yet vaccinated, it's not because they haven't been inundated with information. It could be that the information that they have are from uh, the disinformation sources or from community sources. Because of the ubiquitousness in the news or in communities and what people are talking about, people have a lot of information. Whether it's the right information and whether they trust the information, that's really important. One of the few slides that I will repeat that I also included in the January webinar is this continuum of vaccine acceptance. Um, and that's what is important. And you know, uh, one of the things I talked about in previous webinars, the language that we use, Vaccine hesitancy, there's also people who say don't use vaccine hesitancy because it sounds like they're hesitant. Instead, talk about vaccine acceptance and things like that. So this is the continuum of vaccine acceptance that shows vaccine hesitancy. And you can see at the far end on the left side where there are individuals, and that's where we, we talked about in the previous slide with the men versus women, the refuse all. And then it goes along a continuum, the refuse but unsure, delay, refuse some, and then goes over to the accept all. Probably most of the accept all have been vaccinated at this time and accept but unsure. Um, even yesterday, I was having a conversation um, with one of my friends and she said, you know, when I went to go get vaccinated, you know, you hear just, she goes, I know, I know what is what I'm supposed to do, but, you know, I go to the vaccination center and there's military and fatigues and I get really scared. And she was having a lot of doubts about going to get vaccinated. And I think that's important to validate in here. Um, but overall, what's important is that vaccine hesitant people should be treated with compassion, sensitivity, and respect. And so what happens sometimes on, you see it on social media, people, they sort of yell or, at people who aren't vaccinated. But if you if you try to be empathetic to what they're coming from, there's a whole series of reasons why they may not be comfortable with vaccination. So that's important. That's important to think about when you are dealing with different audiences and so on. Okay, so this is a great, uh, this is also to show you vaccine hesitancy. Now this was done in a nationwide survey in July. And this map highlights areas of the US. And it also highlights areas of the US that would benefit most from increased vaccine acceptance. And those are the reds and the oranges and the yellows compared to the, the blues and the other colors at the very end of the spectrum. So what it shows is by county, the percentage of survey respondents who answered yes, probably, or no, probably not when asked 
if a vaccine to prevent COVID were offered to you today, would you choose to get vaccinated? This is from the Delphi group at Carnegie Mellon University that they did in partnership with Facebook. And you could actually go to the site in the upper right hand corner and type in your zip code and it will tell you the vaccine hesitancy of where you are. And what's interesting, if you overlay this map to some places where the hotspots, that's where we're seeing some of the impact. All right, so we're going to try to do a poll. And here's the poll, because we're now going to start talking about what influences people and what demographic characteristic influences people the most to be vaccinated. So I think Nikki is going to um, push the poll. I think, Nikki, if that's incorrect, yell at me. Uh, but yeah, so what is the dominant demographic factor that influences whether people get vaccinated? That's what it should say at the end. So please fill that out. Your answers will not be, your individual answers will not be revealed. You will not be shamed for your guesses. Uh, so please participate. Um, good. Thank you all these people for participating. I love it. As a research nerd, I love seeing these numbers increase. I wish they would do this for all our surveys. All right. Okay, so let's reveal the response. Share results. I think I'm gonna do this right, Nikki. Um, Nikki, can you see the uh, can you see the response? Yeah, it says it's sharing. Can you see it on your screen? I can see it. I just want to make sure everyone else can too. Yep. Okay, perfect. So the 72% of you got the answer correct that political affiliation is the dominant demographic factor that does influence whether people will get vaccinated. And then it seems that race and age were the others that came into play as well. Now, what's interesting about that is not to discount race and age because we're gonna talk about that, how that is a factor also in getting vaccinated. So thanks for playing along, I really appreciate that keep everyone engaged. All right, so here's another, this is also uh, people who had the uh, age response. Here's what we can see. Most unvaccinated adults fall within that 30 to 49 age range. So if you look at the left column, that first column going down, that is the unvaccinated adults. Uh, most are white and Republican. Um, and the Kaiser Family Foundation has been tracking the wait and see crowd and other sources have too, which is the ones in the middle. These are the ones who wanna sort of wait and see what happens or wait for the full approval from the FDA. And then the column on the far right is the definitely not get the vaccines. These individuals are likely to be white and Republican as well between the ages of 30 to 49. They have some college and are more likely to be suburban and 32% are white evangelicals. This isn't this isn't shocking. This is sort of how um, how what we have seen. But if you look at the chart, political affiliation does play a role more than any other characteristic. Um, and some of these overlap; they're not mutually exclusive. So if you're insured or uninsured, you know you don't go into different pockets with an age because it's like a separate category, which is why it adds up to 100% because you're either insured or you're not. Okay, so let's talk about why people are vaccine hesitant. There's some really great charts and uh, ways to show vaccine hesitation. So I thought this was really neat. This was published in the New York Times, but it was done by um, it was done by Sergo Ventures. And what it does is it shows the various types of people who are worried about getting vaccinated. This is also geographic based. Somebody asked a political affiliation was. Uh, merely a trend in the US, it, it is not a trend in the US. It seems that with some ideologies and, and trust in government and those sort of factors, there is uh, that is at play quite a bit, as well as the historical issues within, uh, within the um, dynamics of the system itself. So if you were in a government that has historically not been as transparent and honest in the past, then you're less likely to trust. So if you look here at this, they have, now, first of all, I would rather you look at the categories than the percentages. The percentages are, they're a little older than we would like. They reported this um, in uh, through February, but look at the categories of that people are either watchful, they're waiting to see what happens. They're cost anxious. They want the vaccine, but can't afford the time or cost. What's interesting about the vaccine is that people will say that they about cost, usually about 3% of the vaccine hesitant, the cost is a factor, but the vaccine doesn't cost money. So there's definitely an opportunity to convey that as well. 
You have another portion that are system distrusters, basically on the healthcare system or the government, and then COVID skeptics. Why it's important to outline the different crowds is your strategies for approach should be different. You cannot have a one size fits all strategy for vaccine increase. It's just not gonna work. And, in, and here's just some examples. When they released the study, they gave very specific guidelines for how certain groups should be approached within the different states. So for example, they suggested that for COVID skeptics, that you go to Arkansas, North Dakota, while Mississippi and Alaska should focus on the cost anxious. And then you, DC and Maryland should be part of the system distrusters. So these are, it's like different strokes for different folks. What are we dealing with? So what I wanted to do was I made a laundry list of why people are vaccine hesitant. And I think that is important because it shows specifically why people may not get the vaccine. People may have health or medical issues. And while people who are pregnant or breastfeeding can get vaccinated, they may choose uh, not to because of concerns about safety and other things. So we want to recognize that as well. People have a distrust of science, government, vaccine safety. The, when we talked language about the warp speed, that didn't do the process any good. Uh, and this emergency use authorization um, is problematic. People have a fear of needles. They have a fear of the side effects. There's been a lot of discussion over potential side effects, which for some with who have resource issues like childcare or their work hourly jobs and can't take time off, it's really hard when you hear reports of people who were down for a few days because of the COVID vaccine. Also that loss of autonomy and freedom, it's my choice to get vaccinated. There's a slew of disinformation uh, social criticism or alienation is really interesting because some individuals and vac who are vaccinated or not vaccinated are not comfortable sharing or getting vaccinated or not getting vaccinated because they feel like they're in a community that either accepts it or doesn't accept it. Um, there was a great article in the New York Times, and I believe it was in a community in Tennessee, where if you were vaccinated, you sort of kept that to yourself so you wouldn't get alienated or criticized. You have vaccine uh, skeptics in general. You have your communities, your family, your friends and that affiliation. You also have neurological influences, whether it's information processing or how people think about information or uh, certain ways that we are exposed to information. And one of the big factors is also a lack of belief in the seriousness of COVID, that the, the side effects and it are largely exaggerated. So Lee asked about what are the parallels between uh, unvaccinated and level of education. There is a relationship that people who are not vaccinated are more likely to be uh, high school education or some college. That's a good question. So here's a, here's a great survey that just came out like a month ago about why people remain unvaccinated. The top reason why the vaccine hesitant may not have gotten their shots, according to this New York Times survey on July 5th, was uh, side effects and safety. Those were the top reasons. But then as you go down, you see the other, you'll see the sort of theme throughout that it's the trust factor. And those are, and then you have people who just don't believe they need it because they, people who don't believe they need it, don't believe that that COVID is a, uh, and, and you see this even in some reports where people talk about, I'm very young and not me specifically, but I'm very young and healthy, therefore I don't need a vaccine. So here's what's also really interesting because the safety of the vaccines that we talked about were really one of the big um, factors that came up here. But if you look at this chart, it says that a lot of the unvaccinated adults are not confident. If you look at the top chart, those are vaccinated adults and the bottom chart are unvaccinated. You can see there is a tremendous difference this is from the Kaiser Family Foundation Vaccine Monitor. This is their July 2021 data, and they report every month. So there, if you want to sort of track what's going on month to month, there's, that's the good place to do it. But look at the stark difference. At least 60% overall of the unvaccinated are not too confident or not at all confident. That number is significantly worse for J&J. &J. That should be really important for when you're encouraging people to get vaccinated and how to get vaccinated. If you have 78% of people who are not too confident or not at all confident with J&J, &J, I mean, it's really problematic. And you see how small those numbers are with the confidence in the Pfizer and Moderna and overall vaccinations. 
Others have somewhat confidence and that's good news because that shows that you can push it over to that. So here's another one is the majority, and this is all ties together. And this is why there isn't like a one a quick fix. We can check a box and here's how we're gonna get all these people vaccinated. It really is like a very coordinated campaign thinking about what the concerns are of individuals within certain communities who exhibit certain demographic and geographic factors. And we're all people. So even though we have people in this box, it doesn't mean that there, if A happens, B automatically happens because People are individuals and they process information differently and they have all sorts of different um, uh, societal influences and family and so on. So the majority of unvaccinated adults say that they think that the, that the news has generally exaggerated the seriousness of the coronavirus, where the vaccinated sort of think the opposite. Three-fourths of vaccinated adults say the news has been generally correct or generally unestimated the pandemic seriousness. So this is the, the view of the seriousness of the coronavirus has been exaggerated is sort of the dominant view among those who say they definitely not will get vaccinated. So that's really telling and really problematic. And, you know, it's sometimes I think with executives, we want to get all these great publications in place to get the word out there, but that's not who are trusted sources for the individuals who need to get vaccinated. There's also a lot of indirect costs that I don't think we talk about with getting vaccinated. Um, planning and making appointments, uh, website crashes. I mean, if you have a, a like a not professional website or it's kind of, you know, junky, it's gonna, it can, doesn't convey seriousness of the vaccination. Like if there's some sort of site or, or site internally, it has to be very well done because that also helps convey trust. I mean, childcare, the wait times even for vaccines that people may think that it may take a long time and it may be difficult to get to, to get the vaccine as well as like schedules you have. And then you have the lost income for hourly employees as well as the potential downtime for side effects. So let's talk about the role of organizations in increasing vaccine uptake. Um, so first question, uh, I'm gonna answer this, you don't have to answer this. Uh, that would be a really long poll question. Can employers require, can, yes, employees to get vaccinated? Any company in the U.S. is within its legal rights to require employees to get vaccinated as long as they account for disability or religious belief. And that is according to the U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, who released an update to this guidance in late May. Some companies don't want to enact mandates until the FDA grants full approval. So right now, there are, the vaccines are currently on emergency use authorization. Full approval typically requires the FDA to review hundreds of thousands of documents and pages, like 10 times the data of what the, um, the emergency use authorization has. And that usually takes about six to eight months. Uh, recently, the FDA announced that they have redirected some of their other initiatives so they can focus more on getting these vaccinations, the full authorization. And um, Stat News, uh, which was also covered in the New York Times, said that it could be September, even October, when they do grant full vaccination, FDA approval to most likely it will be Pfizer first. When we see that happen, we will see some of the vaccination numbers increase, primarily because a lot of the um, uh, a lot of the organizations are sort of waiting for this. Uh, like most other employees of federal agencies, civilians working for the Defense Department must be vaccinated or face regular testing. But the military has not ordered shots for their one point over million active duty service people until the FDA grants full approval. The city of San Francisco is doing the same thing. They have almost 500, uh, 545,000 employees. And once that becomes full authorization, you go through all the steps and process, then uh, their employees must be vaccinated within 10 weeks of approval. Uh, the State University of New York is doing the same thing with its 400,000 um, students. So they do not, so uh, federal EEO laws do not prevent an employer from requiring all employees physically entering the workplace to be vaccinated as long as they, they, um, they comply with uh, religious exemption and disability exemption. And the accommodation provisions of the ADA and Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and other EEO considerations. 
Uh, laws do not prevent them from offering incentives uh, or confirmation of a vaccination from a third party. One of the interesting things that the, um, the EEOC has reported on is coercion. So they gave this guidance on coercion, but then they didn't really explain it. And even after clarification was requested, the EOC was still basically like, we don't want to clarify it this time. Um, but basically what it says is that companies cannot coerce their employees to get vaccinated. Uh, but it doesn't really tell you what exactly that means. But um, so that means you have to be really careful about the incentives that you give if you offer on-site vaccinations, which typically isn't the case. But um, they, they, there was a um, where there were wellness guidelines that the EEOC issued and said that you could give employees, they called them like de minimis gifts, which are the, which are smaller gifts like water bottles or gift card of modest value to encourage wellness program enrollment without running afoul of, of uh, federal anti-discrimination laws. Those were guidelines under the Trump administration and the EEOC has paused them at this time. Um, but the, the, the important news is that a district court in Texas in June ruled that offering a choice between vaccination and termination of employment does not amount to coercion. And that was the case that you may have all heard of. That was a hospital's decision to require its employees to be vaccinated, which they did with the intent of keeping staff, patients, and families safe. So the court said that the plaintiff is free to be vaccinated or not as he or she or they chooses. But if they choose not to be vaccinated, they will have to work somewhere else. So that, and that has also followed uh, the guidelines that were issued by Indiana University who had students take a complaint. And that was a very conservative judge. And they said, you also have the choice to not attend school there or file a religious um, or medical exemption. So let's look at, here's what we also hear. So let's clarify this. Businesses and uh, whether it's a, you hear this, you hear this from people like, it's a HIPAA violation. Businesses and other entities can absolutely ask about vaccination status. It is not a HIPAA violation. The Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act was created to protect patients' confidential health information, but it was made for the intent of providers, healthcare providers, of what they can share with others. It is not for employees and what they can ask for. Companies can ask their employees if they have received the vaccine, but you can't ask why they haven't received the vaccine. If you are providing the vaccine as a part of a HIPAA covered health or program, they, you'll have to have the employee sign like an authorization form to let the, to give you access to that type of information. But vaccine cards can be openly shared with uh, employers by the employees without HIPAA oversight. By the way, I suggest people call them vaccination cards rather than vaccination passports. Passport sounds a little lofty and not everybody has a passport in the US. And um, I think it does create some sort of equity issues. And if the employee goes out and shares their vaccine status, that is totally fine. But you are well within your right to ask employees if they were vaccinated. And it should be for the purpose of protecting the safety of others. All right, so let's say this is, it changes every day. Oh, my Walmart logo looks terrible. It changes every day. I mean, be, up until a couple of weeks ago, companies were following more of a carrot versus a stick approach where they were like, we really would like you to get vaccinated and encouraging people. But all these, all these listed in some way are requiring at least some of their employees to be vaccinated. Walmart is the nation's largest private employer, 1.6 million workers. And what they're uh, requiring is that any of them working in corporate offices have to be vaccinated. And then from a lot of the organizations, they give you some sort of timeline of rollout. Like you have to be vaccinated by this. If not, you get suspended. And then if you don't do it by this time, then you get fired. Um, 400 other colleges and universities have also said they're requiring vaccinations. Fun fact that almost all are in states that voted for Joe Biden, which makes sense because if you're a state, if you're a state, and if usually, you know, and not always, but usually the, um, the state board and the education, the governor is related to how it was voted. Uh, but it shows that the power of politics within this discussion. But mostly what we're seeing is that companies are either requiring all employees to be vaccinated, requiring some of their employees to be vaccinated, or encouraging their employees to get vaccinated. Um, and we've also seen some changes to masking policies, even with saying, regardless if you're vaccinated or unvaccinated, you have to wear a mask. Um, 
Disney is requiring all its salaried and non-union hourly employees in the U.S. to be vaccinated. Um, but employees in industries like retail, restaurants, manufacturing, who are probably most exposed to customers and coworkers um, in their day-to-day -day are not under such mandates. Um, companies are starting to require vaccines for corporate workers also because they're eager to open their offices and believe that mandating the shots will allay many of their concerns. And that was, um, that was a statement made by Brian Krupp, who's chief of HR research at uh, Gartner. State governance, governments in the Biden administration have also issued vaccine mandates in their capacity as employers, but not with the general public, uh, which follows under that mandate and coercion. So as many as 7 million federal workers are now required to show proof of vaccination. Um, New York City, we all saw they were gonna require proof of vaccination for indoor like uh, facilities and so on. Yeah, so someone asked about the vaccine card and vaccine passport are really the same thing. It just shows proof of your vaccination. Okay, so here's what the public thinks. The public is divided on whether the federal government should require vaccines among their employees. The survey was conducted through July 27th, so it's really new. Um, half say the federal government, so this is important, the federal government should, oops, look, I went ahead, should recommend employers require their employees to get the COVID-19 vaccination unless they have a medical exception. While a similar 45% uh, say the federal government should not recommend this. Views toward the issue are sharply divided by both vaccination status and party identification. Here we go with it again. 68% of vaccinated adults and 75% of Democrats say the federal government should issue this recommendation while eight in 10 unvaccinated adults and 67% of Republicans say the federal government should not do this. So we see the big differences uh, between perceptions and how do we close that gap? So let's talk about some interventions and incentives. All right, time for another poll for you. So what is the best intervention strategy for increasing vaccine uptake? First option is a million dollar lottery. Second are mandates requiring the vaccine. Third are incentives like gift cards and entertainment tickets. And then last is recommendation from a healthcare provider. Give you a moment to answer those questions. They're coming in. Do, do, do. Not as many people filled out this one. Are you all doing emails? What's going on? All right, we'll go ahead and end the poll. And the winner is recommendation for healthcare provider. And that is wrong. <laughs> the winner is mandates requiring the vaccine. The number one way to increase vaccine uptake is to require it. And that could be employer-led requirement or the government requiring it. I doubt the government will require it outside of their uh, uh, piece as an employer, but yes. So if you are an employer, making people take a vaccine is the best intervention strategy. But I don't want to discount the importance of a recommendation from a healthcare provider. That is also extremely important. Incentives like gift cards and entertainment tickets and million dollar lottery, uh, million dollar lottery, no, but the incentives like gift cards and entertainment tickets Oh, I don't think I shared that, but sorry. But the million dollar lottery, no, but the gift cards and entertainment tickets are a little wonky. And I'm gonna give you some great data to sort of back that up. Thank you to all those who participated, really appreciate it. Okay, so let's go through this and see what we have. All right, intervention strategies, all sorts of different ones, private companies, donuts, time off, that sort of thing. State governments are giving scholarships, million dollar lotteries. Um, I mean, gosh, even from like West Virginia, giving away custom hunting rifles to uh, all sorts of different programs, Krispy Kreme donuts, which we've all heard of. Our local burger place gives out cheeseburgers and beer. I guess that's what we, we love in Seattle, cheeseburgers and beer. So uh, here's, what may, here's what may motivate the unvaccinated to get a shot. The wait and sees, the wait and sees that full FDA approval and then the available from personal physician. Right, those are two of very important. So I think we'll see an uptick once the full FDA approval comes, especially for the wait and sees. The definitely not, what's interesting to me is the definitely nots, they waver. They say definitely not, but then like, wait a second, 
maybe I will. Um, but like the event tickets, $20 food coupon, that doesn't work. We'll talk about the $100 cash. The what we've also seen is the requirement to fly, which I don't think will ever happen, but uh, for domestically, but the requirements of like getting people back to what needs like what we call normal or pre-precedented times or whatever it is, that's what one of the triggers are for this particular uh, group. So I want to talk to you a little bit about the sweepstakes and lotteries. So as you know, uh, Mike DeWine, the governor of Ohio, he was one of the first to come up with this incentive lottery. And um, Vax a million, and it had mixed results. We, I'm in Washington state, we had the same sort of thing. And what was funny is that most of the people who won a lottery didn't even know they were entered in a lottery, which isn't how as a communicator, you wanna have that system. But they're the ones who sort of launched it and they still weren't able to crack the 50% vaccine threshold with that lottery. And that's not, that's not just them. Um, they did see that they did have a 43% boost in vaccination numbers over the previous week, but then the number of vaccinations dropped since then. New Mexico is interesting. They had a vax to the max sweepstakes program the month of July, where rec residents could win prizes totaling $10 million, including like a $5 million grand prize. It said the, sweep, the sweepstakes kept the vaccination rate from declining further, but the initial boost was really small. Um, it was just like vaccine registrations on seven day average were like 1400 per day during the first week of the contest, just 85 more per day than the previous week. But now what they're doing is they're doing a second round of vaccination incentives called Stay Ahead New Mexico. And this is a program they did in June where, well, when they did it the first time, it was targeting Hispanic audiences. And now what they're doing for August is all new Mexicans 12, uh, 12 and up are eligible for a $100 incentives for getting a dose of the vaccine. And any dose qualifies, but you can only get one per person. So what we're gonna, what you're gonna see most likely is that people won't get the second vaccination. And they did this again because Joe Biden talked to praise the program um, at his uh, press conference last week. So they're gonna do it again. The program did lead to a 333% increase in single shot vaccinations and 26% overall boost in completed vaccinations. But those numbers weren't tremendously large to start with. Um, but uh, it, even like California, they did it and it was still kind of noted. You also have to be careful of how people are reporting it. Um, I know like California, they reported their numbers about the increase following uh, Memorial Day weekend, which um, that during a holiday weekend, you typically see a decline anyway. So I would, if you look at numbers, just really dig into how that is reported. Okay, so Minnesota, this is a really interesting case. I find the Minnesota case really interesting. They did a vaccine program and it was um, for the month of June and it was roll up your sleeves, Minnesota. And then they gave you uh, nine different, nine different rewards you could choose from, whether it was tickets to the state fair, fishing licenses, um, it was like amusement park tickets, $25 Visa gift card. I mean, all sorts of uh, different programs and prices. What we do see with some of the uh, vaccination influences is that you have to go and request what you want to get. It's not that you show up and they give you the state fair tickets or the $25 Visa gift card. You have to go and, and take an extra step and go to the website. So of those 135,000 doses, only 17,000 requested a reward. So you're talking about fewer than 20%. And then based on that, what do you think the most effective reward was? Drum roll, doo -doo 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 -doo. it was the gift card. 57% chose the $25 Visa gift card. And what we're seeing overall is that when there is some sort of incentive, money is, is one of the best ways to do it. There's other different incentives that you can have to encourage people to get vaccinated. From a political standpoint, the return to normal and different activities is really important and being able to get around and not mask and like go into places and not wear a mask. Um, so uh, that return to normal, you can see what, now this has changed, this guidance has changed uh, with the Delta variant, but when what you're also seeing, I know I didn't include this in my presentation, but in the state of Washington, we have a lot of restaurants and bars and they're not mandated by uh, the state, but who you have to have a vaccine card to go in. 
And um, if not, you have to wear a mask and like quickly get your stuff and get out. But there's different like sporting events, giving like best seats to people who are vaccinated, all these different parts, traveling, resuming sort of normal activities and just making life easier. The making life easier is really interesting because you know, right now, some companies, Salesforce is an example, where only vaccinated people are allowed back in the office. So that's sort of that social incentive or, OK, that's fine. You don't want to get vaccinated or, you know, for other reasons. And so then you're going to have to do a weekly testing, mandatory masking, social distancing. So some organizations are making it difficult for the unvaccinated to stay unvaccinated. That's another incentive, by the way. There was also a discussion in my research about other sort of financial incentives, and that is you charge people higher health insurance and life insurance premiums who aren't vaccinated. Because as we're seeing, healthcare premiums may go up and healthcare costs for those, um, for just overall for the impact of COVID. So that way it sort of redistributes it. I also want to point out, though, the disadvantages, some of the research into the disadvantages of incentives. One is inequity. That you know, people who were vaccinated very, very early on, that you're favoring people who weren't vaccinated uh, first. So it sort of rewards bad behavior. And, you know, some researchers believe that when you give an incentive, and it's kind of like, you know, when you go on a plane and they're like, who wants to delay their flight for $100? And you're like, heck no. But if you're like, what about $1,500? All of a sudden people are waving volunteering. So what could happen is people could be waiting for a better incentive down the line. And that what we may see also if we have like a booster. So those are some considerations. The other thing about incentives sometimes is that they may signal that the vaccine is not safe or it's not desirable, right? If you're like, please, please, please take this vaccine, please, 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 here's an incentive. I mean, then it may tell them that, you know, I don't know, is this undesirable? Should I trust this vaccine? So let's talk about uh, eight steps employers can take to increase vaccine uptake. Oops. The first is to review your organizational mission and purpose. How does the vaccination align with your organization mission and purpose? If you're an organization, and especially a healthcare organization, and your mission is focused on making the world safer, healthier, caring for people, then you have to think about vaccine requirements. Does that align with your organizational mission and purpose? And if you, if you don't have any sort of standards or encouragement, are you sort of violating that mission and purpose? I'm not saying you are, I'm not being judgy. I'm just telling you just some things with what you have to think about when you're looking at mandates or encouraging or so on. The next one is to really understand your audience and tailor strategies based on the demographics, um, which geography and psychographics. So let me give you an example. So this is from Ogilvy. Uh, Chris Graves did this work in uh, 2019. He leads their Behavioral Science Center. And uh, this he's done a lot of work on vaccine hesitation and confidence before COVID. So if you create sort of profiles of individuals and who they are, it will help with your different strategies. So as you can see, if you're more hierarchical and you could also tie this in any ways you want, um, but you can see, you can see uh, the description of individuals. And then when you click in, it tells you, here's how you should sort of treat people and the impact on vaccination views, right? That, because if you're saying if people aren't as interested in community or herd immunity, then you don't want to have a message that talks about like helping others. Or if some people don't accept the interventions of big pharma, then you don't want to overly focus on Pfizer and the, the medical system itself. So you want to take these sort of cultural cognition and vaccination views and make it um, and then tailor it that way. So another, uh, another part, and I, I shared the slide also in my first webinar I did, but this is a really great matrix that talks about vaccine hesitancy. And I include it here because understanding your audience is really complicated and it comes with a bunch of factors. So here you have contextual influences, individual and group influences, vaccine, vaccination specific issues, all these different areas that you have to think about. And you can't have, if you're a global organization, if you are, if you're based in different states, you have to treat all these different 
components differently. Um, I, uh, Dr. Hilary Fussell Cisco, of, uh, who's um, the editor of our PR journal, she's a professor and chair at Quinnipiac University. I was talking to her last week, and they have a program in Connecticut, and it's um, it's a grant by the state. And they're sending, um, they trained students in different communities and then sent them out through the state of Connecticut to help increase vaccination rates for younger adults, but using them through like younger ambassadors. And each sort of community has a completely different strategy depending on who the audience is, are. So that's really important. So you can't have just like, here's our corporate vaccine strategy when you're based in areas that when we showed you the vaccine hesitancy um, chart, when showing you the different sort of cognitions and psychographics people have, you have to take that into consideration. And then use theories and research. As a research organization, this is what we always promote, but also pull in behavioral science, read our paper, uh, and understand how people think, including biases. I mean, so there's all sorts of biases that you have, whether it's like optimism bias, you, you see like, oh, I'm not, I'm not worried about it. I'm really healthy. I work out all the time. I'm going to be totally fine versus like status quo that, you know, I think that will, we see this. I was talking about this before we even had the whole vaccination open that this is, you sort of predict what people are going to say. Like I'm more concerned about the vaccine risk rather than COVID. And that's that status quo bias. People have a tendency to ra rather not act. Um, and the one thing that I should have pointed out with the bias as well is that people also have a hard time admitting that they're wrong. So if you're sitting here as a person, you're like, I will never get vaccinated, never, never, never. And you have this line, it's very hard to go back and say, you know, I was wrong. We are seeing that more, especially with people who have been infected seriously with COVID. Um, oops, did you see? I just went backwards. Here we go. There's another important chart I wanted to show you about knowing your people. And here's sort of what we have with, we have to think of also um, equity and equality. We know that um, Hispanic and black populations are less likely to get vaccinated, even though we see those numbers improving some. So you have to think about the different resources and the systemic uh, distrust in the system. So I really, really love this chart and um, understanding the differences between equity, equality, reality, and justice. So if you look at the, the, um, the uh, looks like an adult and two kids, equality means you're giving everyone the same sort of tools, right? But you're, you assume that they're operating all from the same place, but we know people don't operate from the same place. So then you see equity, where equity means you give the tools to the people who need it most. So it may include a different distribution of resources. So if you know that in your area that you have low vaccination rates with certain populations, then the focus should be on that. It shouldn't be, all right, but we'll still distribute to these areas the same sort of resources. No, you sort of pull and pull more resources that way so it can focus on that. The reality is, is that sometimes the people who don't need it the most do get, uh, whether it's resources or others. And justice is when everyone can see the game without support or accommodations because the cause of inequity was addressed and the system systemic barrier was removed. So I really love this. I really love this a lot. This is also really good, and this is really important. So one of the, uh, the reps, uh, Miller Meeks, she had a great video encouraging people to take the coronavirus vaccine. So she's a Republican, and it's a great video because what we've seen in the research and how you have like white Republican um, evangelicals, there are concerns about the vaccine, like safety, like making sure we have autonomous decision-making, that the virus isn't necessarily um, uh, as real as what's portrayed in the media. And she has, she addresses this all within the video. So if you haven't seen it, I highly recommend you just Google that and go to it. And here's also a really interesting take on it too, that I pulled up a couple of town halls and you can see how these, these could be problematic, right? So look at this first town hall. It's so you have a diverse panelist, you have all sorts of people with different levels of expertise. You also want to be careful sometimes with if you're trying to target a certain group, you don't necessarily want it to be too political. And you also see the red and the blue. But if you were trying, if you were in Texas, Senator State District Charles Perry, if you were trying to target a different demographic, say if you're like Democrats, it's not going to work with this teletown hall. They wouldn't do that anyway. 
but you know, you want to get people who are the experts who can really talk about it. And you just want to be overly careful of bringing in political or government or things like that. Um, and then we do at uh, IPR, maybe uh, if someone could drop a chat from our team, we have a great COVID-19 vaccine resource center that you can go. The paper I talked about is in there and we also update. We'll, uh, we will send out this webinar, it will be recorded and we'll send it out and then we'll include a link that as well in the resource center. Another great step is to encourage primary care provider well visits. This is especially the case with black and Hispanic populations and telling your employees to go see their primary care provider because most of them will talk, they will ask you about the COVID vaccine and have that conversation. If the primary care provider has that vaccine on hand, then it's much easier to get it in the arms of the individuals. Vaccine and how the vaccine should be regarded is it should, instead of focusing on the vaccine, people really should focus on the disease itself and ending this terrible disease. But the COVID vaccine should be part of the regular wrap up of what you do for your annual checkup, right? Instead of making the COVID vaccine like this extra thing, it should be encouraged as part of your overall wellness system, like flu shot, COVID vaccine, here's what you have to get. Same thing when I'm, I'm actually taking my son who's too young to get vaccinated uh, to for his wellness check. But if he was old enough, I'm sure that my, um, my pediatrician would recommend that he get this shot, which he hates, or other shots, and then like the COVID is part of that wrap up and not as an add on. But what we also see though, is that healthcare workers are them, some of them are hesitant themselves. This is where research and understanding the audience comes to play. Not surprisingly, what research does find is that people who care for COVID patients or have come in contact are less likely to be vaccine hesitant than healthcare providers who, have, who don't necessarily come in contact or see that uh, on a basis which is why that um, you'll see a disconnect. And even in some facilities or healthcare facilities or retirement facilities where you have 90% of the health of the um, resident population vaccinated, but only 50% of the healthcare provider vaccinated, that is really problematic. Here's also another little thing I just wanna throw in here. It does also shows the importance of research. When you're a doctor and the sort of tone that you take with a patient also has an impact. If you are a doctor and you take a more of a um, presumptive tone, meaning I am the I am the author authority here. I know this is really important. This is why you need the COVID vaccine. It's important for your health. It's important for X. That is way more effective than asking people. You can ask them what they think. But you don't want to, but if you give people like, what do you think about this vaccine? And I'll leave it up to you to make that decision. If you give them that, which of course it is their decision, but if you give them that more participatory tone, then they're less than they're more likely to resist because you want your provider to be an authority. I mean, I had the same experience um, with a, my orthopedist and he was like, well, what do you want to do? And I was like, I don't know. I'm not a doctor. You tell me. So that's sort of where, you know, in some cases you want people to be more authority wise. The other things that I wish that we would do more of in our organizations is to educate employees about health literacy. According to a report by the National Assessment of Adult Literacy, nine out of 10 adults in the US lack the ability to understand basic medical information and engage in self-care and chronic disease measurement. The Health Resources and Services Administration said that low health literacy is more prevalent among older adults, minority populations, those with low socioeconomic status and medically underserved people. And then, you know, we have all these other programs internally, but I, I'll just say the other criticism I have with some of the trainings that organizations also have is a lack of media literacy, which how you, how you, because we do a lot of stuff on disinformation, but that's also really important. The other area is using local news sources. We do a study every year of what I just mentioned on disinformation and consistently local news and local newspapers are some of the most trusted sources. And that isn't just an IPR phenomenon, that is, that is across the board that comes up. People trust local news, or news sources. And that is one of the few areas where political affiliation doesn't um, change the two. That uh, Republicans, Democrats, uh, independents all trust uh, overall compared to others, their, uh, their local news sources. The other thing is it's really important to leverage your, I'm sure a lot of you probably are, but leverage those employee resource groups. 
they're really the ones who are best suited to communicate as well as your CEO. And also who are your internal influencers and how is the local community and what do people perceive to be the tenor of the local community and how you get people to do that? Oh, I see. Okay, yes, people put the EEOC guidelines. We can always send those out as well. Um, it's someone said, Carolyn said, is it okay to ask and see a student's vaccination card? I mean, it's who's non-employee. I would ask your administrator. I know that some universities, and it, it also depends on the state where it is. I've heard mixed where they say you can't ask the um, the card. I heard one university, which is a big state university, say that's a FERPA violation, which Carolyn, you and I both know that is absolutely not a FERPA violation or what it is, but that's the same thing that people use. Like it's a HIPAA violation. That is not a HIPAA violation. So uh, I would find out from your HR what sort of line they are, but yes, yes. It's much better. You know, a lot of universities are requiring vaccinations, which seems to me that that would, if I was teaching in person in university, I would feel a lot more safer in that situation unless everyone's masked up and socially distanced. But then how long do people want to do this for? You know, I mean, that's the other thought and side note. Like, how long do we want to continue social distance and masking if we could try to, you know, improve on a global scale, like vaccine uptake? The other thing is also to, I know we're sort of, uh, we have a, just a couple minutes left, but really offer data and set internal public goals and targets. And of course you would keep it confidential, but like dashboards are your friend in Tableau and other places, this is uh, Microsoft. They have really great dashboards that can tell you a lot and also help the safety of how your um, employees feel without identifying. Now, if you have an office with three people in it, you don't necessarily have a dashboard devoted to them because they can be identified just because there's only three people. But what I found really helpful, and this is my kids are in the Seattle public schools, is a dashboard that gives you information and it makes you feel a uh, safe and uh, something like that. And Melissa wants to move on. Yes, I hear you, Melissa. Yes, yes. I want to. I want to be able to travel and do fun things, and my kids do fun things too. But yes. Uh, plus, by the way, this dashboard was really easy for me to find, and I used this when my kids were in school to see what was happening. And that is really key. I went to other states. Uh, I, I traveled to Florida. Um, like a month ago, I was very masked. But I. But I. It was very hard to find. Like dashboard i know they had the uh the person who was um a, 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 you know fired and she had her own dashboard but i was trying to find dashboards or just data it was really difficult to find so make it easy for your employees and keep them informed and this is a really great like here's our vaccination summary for king county and this is in where seattle is where i live and what you could also do which i can't do it because of this and because if you click on demographics it tells you all the details demographics you can see here that they they segment it in terms of Asian, Black, Hispanic, all these, the native Hawaiian Pacific Islander, and then geography. I could click on geography and dial down to my neighborhood. So I can see that the vaccination rate in my neighborhood is like 82%. So that is very helpful and tells me a lot. And this data is, a, is already a month old, but then what it tells you is where do my efforts need to be focused? So I think one of my overall points is that you cannot just have a general campaign for all your employees. It has to be it has to be broken up into areas and types and consideration. And that sounds like a lot of work, but it is a lot of work that we have to do to get back to where we need to be. That is it for me. Um, I don't, oh wait, I only did the chat. Did I miss, I think I got all the questions. Um, great, this is great. I'm very proud of myself. So that's it, I don't see any more questions. And uh, what we'll do, this is recorded. We will send this out after, um, uh, after this is over. And uh, I really thank all of you for being here today. You can obviously tell I'm very passionate about this topic. And um, it'll be online. And uh, we have also, by the way, we have some really great master classes in behavioral science. So if you want to learn more about how people think and what to do, please sign up for our master class as well as our, we have one on measurement as well. And thank you all for being here. And we hope to see you again on another webinar very soon. Thank you.